Now I'm going to talk about the second atomic bomb, the one that was tested at the Trinity site in New Mexico and dropped on the Japanese city of Nagasaki. Unlike the first bomb, the uh, gun-type uranium bomb, this bomb required a number of inventions, beginning with the invention of the element that was used as the fissile material in the bomb. Uranium-235 worked in the Hiroshima bomb, but it didn't work well, and it was astronomically expensive to separate the 0.7% of uranium-235 from the bulk of natural uranium, which is uranium-238. If you look at this graph, you will see that the uranium-235 unreflected critical mass of a spherical shape is 46.7 kilograms. If you go down a few lines to plutonium-239, you will see that the same number is 10 kilograms. That is half of the reason why plutonium was chosen over uranium for most of the American arsenal. The other half of the reason is that it is enormously difficult and expensive to enrich uranium and much cheaper to build a huge reactor, create plutonium, and then purify it chemically from the other elements in the spent fuel cartridges. This element was discovered in 1941 by four men working at Berkeley at uh, the what is now the Lawrence Radiation Lab on the Berkeley, California campus. They were Joseph Kennedy, Edward McMillan, Glenn Seaborg, and Arthur Wall. Although these four men all were involved in the uh, first preparation of plutonium, most of them moved on to other projects, and the one who continued to work on uh, plutonium and other transuranics. Transuranic elements are elements beyond uranium, which is the last naturally occurring element in the periodic table. Seaborg gets all the credit for this discovery. Uh, this is typical of Seaborg. Whoever he was working with, it always wound up that Seaborg got the credit. This is the reaction by which plutonium is created in a nuclear reactor. You can see it starts with uranium-238, that's the abundant isotope of uranium, and neutrons. The neutrons come from the fission of the 0.7% of uranium-235. So the small amount of uranium-235 generates neutrons that change uranium-238 into uranium-239. Same element, one more neutron. This uranium isotope is unstable, and it decays with a beta decay with a half-life of 23 and a half minutes into Neptunium-239. This was uh, the first of the transuranic elements, but Neptunium-239 is also unstable, and it undergoes another beta decay with a half-life of 2.35 days, and becomes plutonium-239, which is relatively stable. It has a half-life of about 24,000 years. Notice the naming. Uranium was named for the planet Uranus, which had just been discovered at the time that the element was uh, first purified. Neptunium is named for the planet Neptune, the next one out, and plutonium is named for the planet Pluto, the next one after that. <clears throat> the properties of plutonium metal, as they were known in 1945, are shown in this graph. The most interesting thing about the metal, and the thing that makes it uh, 
prized by metallurgists is that it has at least five different solid phases. That means the atoms in the metal can arrange themselves in five different ways, each of which has different physical properties. The one that's stable at room temperature is called the alpha phase, and the one we're going to be most interested in is called the delta phase, which is stable between 300 and 475 degrees centigrade. You'll notice that the metal melts at 637 degrees centigrade, which is quite low for a metal. This next graph shows how really peculiar plutonium is. This is an experiment in which the metal, plutonium, is formed into a bar, and then that bar is slowly heated, and the length of the bar is measured as, as a function of the temperature. First of all, at the bottom of this picture, you see this graph for iron. It is really boring. Iron has a single phase throughout this temperature range from uh, zero to 650 degrees centigrade, and it has a relatively low coefficient of expansion. But if you look at plutonium, starting with the alpha phase, it has a high coefficient of expansion, three or four times as high as iron, and then when it hits about 100 degrees, there's a sudden increase in the length of the bar as the plutonium metal rearranges itself from the alpha to the beta form. And then again at 200, there's a sudden change in the volume as it goes to the gamma form. And finally, at about 300 degrees centigrade, there's another shift in length, bringing us to the delta form, which has a really strange graph. You see that unlike all the other phases, the delta form decreases in volume as the temperature goes up. This is very rare in a metal. The delta form is most useful because it is, it is amenable to heat and pressure forming. So basically, you don't, you don't have to machine uh, plutonium to make a sphere of it or a hemisphere. Basically, you just put the plutonium into a large hydraulic press like the one you see here, heat it up to uh, the temperature range of the delta form, and you can squeeze this thing into whatever shape you want it to be. Now, in practice, we don't want to work with plutonium as it is because all these phase changes lead to cracking and all kinds of problems with the metal. So it is alloyed with a bit of gallium. 3% uh, gallium will freeze plutonium in the delta phase, even at room temperature. And that's the way we work with it. Modern day plutonium pits, they're called, the center part of the uh, plutonium bomb, are made by casting, as you see in this picture. You can heat the plutonium up and cast it in a mold, and it will uh, retain the shape when it uh, cools. So, at this point, we have plutonium, we have shaped it into a hemisphere, and the next question we have to deal with is how are we going to assemble the plutonium in order to make an explosion?